Hi, I'm Dr. Kim Casada, and I am going to present you some information about a new type of Friday trial that we're doing at Michigan State. We are now evaluating cover crops as well as our more uh, traditional forage type crops. The reason that we started doing this was that we were getting uh, questions from both uh, growers and industry as to what might be the most uh, beneficial cover crops to grow here in Michigan. And we don't really have a organized way to evaluate that. Uh, but using the template that we already use for our variety testing system for forages, we came up with this plan. So what we are trying to do here is give objective evaluation of cover crops side by side to each other that will be published every year for growers to use. Uh, the measurements that we will be taking include biomass. Uh, and because uh, cover crops need to stay in place to prov uh, provide their ground cover benefits, uh, we can't really manage this like a conventional forage test where we would typically go in and mow off the entire plot to get a biomass yield. So we have to do this uh, the harder way and actually go in and do a hand clip sample off part of the plot so that we could leave the rest of it to uh, collect our subsequent measurements of the standing cover crop. So we decided to do the biomass after frost in the fall and again at termination in the spring for cover crops that overwintered. Uh, the rationale for doing the after frost biomass was that that should theoretically give us the maximum biomass that we would be able to have since most of these or many of these cover crops will actually uh, be killed by frost and you won't get any growth after that. Uh, because ground cover is a very important feature of cover crops, we are measuring that at 30 and 60 days after planting and again in the spring before termination. And to do that, we take a picture of the plot using a phone app called Canopio uh, that will tell us the percentage of green pixels in the picture. We're also doing a measurement of weed control, and this is done using a visual rating at, again, at 30 and 60 days after planting and then in the spring. And this is to give us an estimate of how good that particular cover crop is at suppressing weeds. And for that comparison, we also have a plot where no cover crop is planted. It's just a fallow plot. And that's our weed control uh, that we compare everything else to. We look at winter survival uh, with a visual rating in the spring as to whether it winter killed or not. Residue cover, again, rated in the spring. Um, and ease of termination. So after we do our final spring measurements, we go in and terminate the material with a appropriate mix of herbicides. And then two weeks after the termination, we are evaluating the effectiveness of the kill. In 2018 was our first uh, try at this particular type of variety testing. We did it at the Kellogg Biological Station down uh, near Kalamazoo. Uh, we invited public entries each year. Uh, that's the way these public tests are typically done. Our entry fee is currently $299 per entry. We plant the covers in a five by 20 foot plot using a small uh, drill that has been outfitted, you see it right here, so that we can plant a small plot with it. For this particular test, we chose to plant in August to simulate cover crops that would go in after a small grain harvest. Um, we use 30 pounds of starter nitrogen because we want to uh, make sure that our cover crops get off to a good start. There was no weed control other than the cover crops themselves. Uh, because of the seeds that were entered, we had large seeds and small seeds. And so for that reason, we divided the test into two groups. One group was planted at one quarter inch depth and the other group planted at three quarters inch uh, to best uh, meet the needs of the particular type of seed. And we had check plots included for each of our cover crop groups. For example, uh, Jerry Oats was used as a, as a check for the, any other type of oats that were entered. Uh, and here's a picture of our fallow plot right here that was used as our check for weed control. We did encourage mixtures to be uh, shown, 
to be used in this test. Uh, there's a, a downside to mixtures. They're very popular for use as a cover crop, but when you're trying to evaluate them in a testing situation, the problem is that a bag of mix is not always going to be the same mix every time you buy it. Uh, because the varieties or proportions that are in there might change over time due to seed supply or other factors. So we required the companies entering mixtures to tell us exactly what was in that mix, and that will be reported in the publication in this table, showing for each of our mixtures that was entered, which these were all experimental mixtures entered by a country, uh, company so they were given code numbers but you can look at this table and see exactly what species was present in the seed mixture for each of those mixes and our check mix was oats and brassicas this is what our plots look like on September 1st. They were planted mid-August just so this is about two weeks of growth. We had pretty ideal conditions uh, with a nice soaking rain right after we planted the seed. And it was pretty dry after that, but we had enough soil moisture to get things going nicely. This is what we had 30 days after planting. And this is when we did our first round of ground cover and weed control measurements. Here we are 60 days after planting. Again, this was the second round of measurements. The following spring, uh, this is what plots look like when we did our biomass determination the following spring. So you can see some of the plots, like this one over here, which had been a, a radish, was completely winter killed, whereas these grass plots are all annual rye grasses that made it through the winter quite nicely. Here's a picture done two weeks after the termination was done when we were doing our uh, evaluations of effectiveness of the herbicides. Now, getting into some data. This is just a, uh, a picture taken of our ground cover measurements at 30 days after planting. And I'm trying to show the range of what we saw from, uh, from varieties that did not have very much ground cover yet at 30 days to some that were really uh, quite good. So here's an example here of Taipan Balanza clover, which only had 12% green ground cover in this picture. You see there's not very much here. Hairy vetch had 39% ground cover. Low boy ryegrass 68. Barsica rape was starting to get up there into the range we like better, 76%. Koga ryegrass got over 90, which is very good. And the radishes, the ecotil radish was also over 97%. Now what we are looking for in ground cover, we have a marker that we use at 95% ground cover. We figure that the any crop has achieved what we call total canopy cover uh, because basically you've effectively, you're intercepting all of the sunlight that is possible for that that crop to get and also you've got most of the ground covered up. So that's the target we're trying to reach. Looking at the ground cover 30 days later, for several of these the low boy at 30 days was 68% and it got up over 90 uh, by the 60-day mark. Hairy vetch just made it to 90 by the 60-day mark. So the point, take-home point here is that some of these cover crops are going to be much more effective at reaching a high level of ground cover early, uh, but almost all of them were effective by the time we got out to 60 days. Here's the ground cover data. Now this is a little bit of a uh, fancy chart so I'm going to go over what we're looking at here a little bit. This is ground cover at 30 days after planting, 60 days and again in the spring at the three dates that we measured it. We're looking at each of our entries in the test and this is divided up by seeding depth so we have a group over here the quarter inch depth and the big seeds are over on this end to the right and within those seeding depth groups we have annual ryegrasses, clovers, and brassicas at the shallow depth, and oats, legumes, and mixtures at the greater seeding depth. The light green bars are the check variety that was used within each one of these groups. 
Now these bars, the horizontal bars that I'm showing right here, this is a measure of statistical significance. And what this is indicating is the mark that had to be hit within each one of these groups to be statistically the same as that 95% ground cover mark. So basically what that means is anything that has the bar that extends above the black line has reached equivalence to 95% ground cover. And if there is no bar at all with the group, that means that none of them were able to reach that mark. There's no statistical difference. And you can see here that we had very effective ground cover at 30 days for most of the brassicas. Some of the annual ryegrasses were doing pretty good by 30 days. Some of them not so good, but they were all there by 60 days. Another key thing to see here is that for some of the brassicas, we actually had a decline from 30 to 60 days uh, because the leaves actually started to senesce on these and drop off. <clears throat> so these are kinds of decisions you can use to decide if you only have a 30 day window for a cover crop before you're gonna take it out, then you would want something that reached a high degree of ground cover very quickly. One of these that were slow would not be very beneficial to you in that situation. Now for the 240 days, this is again the spring after winter kill had occurred. So if there is no ground cover in the spring, that generally indicates that that was a, uh, something that winter killed. Um, we did have a few of the brassicas, the impact uh, collards in particular, that managed to survive the winter. Um, Another one with good winter survival were, were the hairy vetches. And over here in the mixtures, the ones that got good ground cover in the spring were the ones that contained either annual ryegrass or hairy vetch or both. I'm not going to say a whole lot about weed cover because, uh, or weed control, because for some reason on this particular set of plots, we didn't have very many weeds at all, even in the fallow plots where we planted no covers. And that made it difficult to evaluate how effective the cover crops would be at suppressing weeds when you don't have any weeds to begin with. Um, but what we did tend to find was a relationship between the better the cover crop was doing, the fewer weeds we tended to have. Um, and I guess that's no surprise uh, to anybody. This slide shows our cover crop biomass. A couple of notes on this. Um, here in the brassica group, we had two varieties that were entered as biofumigant crops. And they were, uh, this is not control in as a control variety. This was actually the name of the variety was control. Um, the check in this group is the purple top turnip that's over here. Um, and these ones with the H were actually planted at a higher seeding rate than the other brassicas. Um, which might potentially affect their biomass, although you see it didn't make much difference for the master um, mustard here. Um, the asterisks indicate statistical uh, differences. So anything with an asterisk in, within a group is statistically the same and higher than the ones that don't have asterisks. I tried to group them together for you. So our winner for biomass here was the black oats, which had a, a really surprising amount, was exceeding two and a half tons per acre of biomass after, uh, by the 7th of November. Uh, pretty good biomass on some of the brassicas and also the ryegrasses. I think a key point to look at here is most people think that mixtures are going to be much better in biomass, although most research indicates that monocultures are actually usually gonna have higher biomass accumulation than mixtures. In this case, uh, you know, obviously the winner was one of the monocultures, but we did in fact not see a great advantage in biomass accumulation with these mixtures. Um, and again, you can go back to that table I showed earlier to find out exactly what's in each one of these mixtures. Now we move on to the spring data. There's just some pictures here to indicate what we looked like in the spring with some of our cover crops that winter killed. As we would expect, the radishes did winter kill, also the oats. 
both the black oats and the and the common oats. Our turnips were mostly winter killed. You can see a few of these turnips did actually manage to survive, but there weren't very many of them. The uh, the species that did not winter kill included all of our annual ryegrasses survived quite nicely. Um, our collards, as I mentioned earlier, survived the best out of the brassicas. The balanza clover was still there in the spring and actually looking a lot better in the spring than it did in the fall. Crimson clover, hairy vetch, and the winter peas. So looking at the biomass from those uh, from those varieties that did manage to survive, uh, as you might expect, the spring biomass was a lot lower than what we saw in the fall. Again, we are looking at these at the time of year when you would typically go in to terminate them so you can be ready to plant your next row crop. So we're not looking for maximum spring biomass. Um, in fact, you might consider, in some regards, having a lot of biomass in the spring would be a negative because that's more that you have to kill. Um, depending on what your objectives are in your system. So where it has NSD here, that means no significant difference amongst the varieties within the group. So our annual ryegrasses all had similar yields in the spring. Um, all of our clovers were similar. We really only had the one uh, brassica that had any significant spring yield. No, di well our oats all were winter killed. Our hairy vetch was the uh, best uh, accumulator of biomass in the spring amongst our legume group in the deep-seeded uh, deep seated plants. And again, our mixtures that contained annual ryegrass or hairy vetch uh, had significantly more biomass. Two weeks after spraying, all of our entries were recorded at 90% kill or more, except for one of our annual ryegrasses, which only got a score of 48% kill, and that's the one here in the plot on the right. Um, that one tended to be a shorter ryegrass than the other ones. It's possible that it was at a slightly different stage of maturity on the termination date. I should also point out too, because of the uh, unfavorable spring weather that we had in 2019 when we were doing this, we were just as late with our field operations as everyone else was due to the unending rainfall. And so we were about two weeks late spraying this compared to where we would have liked to be. Um, so all of our annual ryegrasses had actually exceeded the eight inch height that uh, we typically recommend that you spray at. So that concludes our results. How would you use this? Uh, First thing to do is decide which cover crop species you're going to be using based on what your primary goal is for using a cover crop. Then within that species or functional group, look at the variety results within this test and let that direct your selection for which ones might fit your system the best. In other words, if you need more faster ground cover, go with one that exhibits a uh, rapid ground cover. If you are looking for biomass production, then look for one with a higher biomass. Also, also, always remember that seed species and proportions in commercial mixtures do not stay the same from year to year. So if you're looking at a mixture that's published in this test, make sure you look at the proportions of seed that were actually being used in the test and compare that to the mixture proportion that is in what you're planning to buy. If that those mixtures are different, uh, you can't expect it to turn out the same way as this test. Also remember that seed proportion does not equal biomass proportion. If we do this test again, we may at harvest go where we actually separate out the components to see what proportion of the different species in a mix were present, uh, because clearly they were not equal. Um, on many of these. This report will be published as a PDF file that can be downloaded uh, at the MSU Forage Connection website. You can find it here. The name of the report 
it's 2018 Michigan cover crop variety test report. If you go to this web page, go to the extension page and click there, you will be able to find uh, the report on that page. You can get other information um, on the MSU extension cover crops page right here or the Midwest Cover Crops Council page. Or you can contact me um, here at the university um, and I can give you a hand.